Good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Amanda Gefter and her book, Trespassing on Einstein's Lawn. And I came to this book through a, a confluence of, of several factors. My, my uh, late father was a, a physicist and had the opportunity to exchange a few letters with Einstein himself and uh, always had them locked away in the safe deposit box. It was always a, a special family thing. And um, Separately, he and my mother used to go to a uh, particular Chinese restaurant in Philadelphia all the time, and the young son, five-year-old son of the owners, would always hang around and, you know, being playful. But he also liked math a lot, and my dad uh, um, started tutoring him in math. The young man uh, grew up, went to Wharton, and is now uh, at Coastal Partners, a venture capitalist out in, uh, out in Silicon Valley. So my dad helped, helped spawn uh, uh, Silicon Valley Hotshot. Um, so when I heard of Amanda's book and that it involved Einstein, physics, fathers, restu Chinese restaurants, and Philadelphia, where, where I'm from, I realized this was a book I had to read. So uh, without further ado, Amanda Gefter. So first, I just want to thank Google so much for hosting me here today. Um, it's a real privilege to be here in this building and to get to talk to all of you. So when I was 15 years old, my father took me out to dinner at our favorite Chinese restaurant and asked me how I would define nothing. And this was an odd dinner table question, but not entirely out of character for my father, who was this sort of Zen guru, like former hippie turned radiologist. And so I said I would define nothing as the absence of something or the absence of everything. And really, this is how everyone defines nothing, as a void. But my father had a different idea. He had been thinking about this for a while, he told me. And the other day, he had had an epiphany. He was at the mechanics waiting for his car to be fixed. And it dawned on him that you could define nothing as an infinite, unbounded, homogeneous state. So a state of utter sameness that extends without bound forever. And this wasn't a semantic trick. An, an infinite, unbounded, homogeneous state would literally be indistinguishable from a void. It's nothing. But my father thought it was an interesting definition because it defined nothing not in terms of what it isn't, but in terms of what it is. And so he explained all this to me over a plate of cashew chicken. And then he asked me, do you think this could help explain how the universe began? Now, you have to bear in mind, I'm his teenage daughter. I was not exactly the most well-behaved kid. I would not be described as studious. Um, I was failing math class. I was not even taking physics class. I had opted for meteorology, because that was what my high school offered in place of physics for the underachievers. And here my father is asking me how the universe began. And he just sort of shrugged like it was a normal thing to do and said, I think we should figure it out. And so that is how, at 15 years old, I found myself on a mission to figure out the origin of the universe. So my father and I started teaching ourselves physics. Um, we stayed up late every night. We started amassing a crazy collection of physics books, reading everything we could get our hands on, and talking about all these ideas until my mother would yell at us to go to bed. Because if you want to understand this something that came from nothing when the universe was born, you have to look at both sides of the coin. So my father had already thought long and hard about the nothing part, and now we needed to understand the something. And that's what physics is. Which, incidentally, before I started this secret project with my dad, I had no idea what physics was. I didn't take physics class because I thought that physics was like a set of rules and numbers for describing how like levers and pulleys work. And now I know that physics is about uncovering the reality behind appearances. It's about glimpsing this deep and hidden architecture of existence itself. It's about embracing the fact that the world is not what it seems, and that everything is stranger and simpler than we can imagine, and yet comprehensible. And I think if I had known that from the start, I wouldn't have taken meteorology. But eventually, I graduated high school, and I moved to New York City for college. And then when I finished college, I did what 
any physics loving amateur reality hunter would do and I took a job at a bridal magazine. <laughs> so I was working as an assistant at Manhattan Bride and I was there in the office which was really just the one bedroom apartment of a guy named Rick when I read an article in the New York Times announcing this huge physics conference that was going to be happening in Princeton, New Jersey called Science and Ultimate Reality. And all the world's leading physicists were going to gather there to talk about their most cutting edge ideas. So I'm reading this article and a light bulb goes off over my head. I wait until Rick leaves for lunch and then I pick up the phone, I call the people in charge of publicity for the conference and in the most professional voice that I can muster, I lie and say that I'm a journalist and that I'm calling from Manhattan Magazine because that sounded better and that I wanted to come cover the event. Oh, of course, we would love you to come, they said. Great, I said, put me down plus one. Now in that moment, I had no idea how that one little lie would forever alter the course of my life, but I called my dad and I said, pack your bags, we're going to Princeton. So my dad and I show up in Princeton and we crash this physics conference posing as journalists. You know, we found our press badges at the press table, mine said Manhattan Magazine, I had a blank for my plus one, and we put them around our necks and just wandered amongst our heroes like two idiot deer caught in genius headlights. We got to listen to these physicists lecture about their most recent ideas about the nature of reality. And then as if that wasn't good enough, we got to go into this magical little room that they call the press room, where you sit down and they deliver to you one by one, each physicist, so you can ask them questions. It was the most amazing experience of my entire life. And when the conference let out, my father and I just sort of like wandered through the town of Princeton in a daze, talking about everything we had just heard. And eventually we found ourselves on Mercer Street, which is the street where Einstein had lived. And we found his house at 112 Mercer. It was undergoing some sort of construction, so it was sort of cordoned off by yellow tape, like a murder scene. But we just stood there in awe, trespassing on Einstein's lawn, two bogus press badges still hanging around our necks. And it struck me then that this little private hobby that I shared with my dad was maybe going to be something bigger. And it also dawned on me that I was not ready to give up this journalism front because it was like just too good to be true. Like all you need is this press badge and suddenly you can learn physics directly from the physicists. I figured the Manhattan Magazine scam wouldn't work for long because someone was bound to look it up and see that it didn't exist. But I figured I would use it one more time. So when I got back to New York, I called an editor at Scientific American Again, I lied and said I was a journalist of the Manhattan Magazine and that I had been to this conference and I wanted to cover um, it or you know, write an article about physics for their magazine and miraculously he agreed. So my article comes out in Scientific American and suddenly my fake journalism career has just morphed into a real journalism career and I was able to use that to sort of worm my way into more situations where I didn't belong. I'm sure you can see like Stephen Hawking there, front and center. And then there, inexplicably, is me. It was the perfect scam. And at this particular conference, I ended up meeting an editor from New Scientist magazine. We struck up a conversation and I mentioned that I wrote for Scientific American. I didn't mention it was only once and it was the only article I'd ever done. Um, and he suggested maybe I should write for New Scientist. And so I started writing articles for New Scientist. And then um, when I turned 25, New Scientist asked me to be an editor there, landing me the ultimate permanent press badge. Okay, so once I was an editor at like a major science magazine, I had access to everything that my father and I needed to learn physics and start to figure out the origin of the universe, which is the whole point. Um, and I was learning so much, trying to come to grips with this something that supposedly arose from nothing 14 billion years ago. And if you try to learn all of fundamental physics from scratch, 
not only is it a lot to learn, but it can seem like a lot of sort of crazy, unrelated facts. But early on, I had an epiphany that made it infinitely easier to connect the dots and to see the big picture. And so I think if you want to know one thing about fundamental physics, this is the one thing to know. Something is only real if it's invariant. And I'll explain what that means. Something is only real if it remains unchanged in every reference frame. If it changes or disappears from some perspective, then it's not ultimately real. And actually, even though this is a very deep idea, it's something that we all sort of know intuitively. Like, if you were sitting in your lobby and out of the corner of your eye you saw like an elephant walk by, like, even for Google, that would be pretty unusual. And you might find yourself wondering, is that elephant real, or am I having some kind of breakdown? And instinctively, you know there are two strategies that you can use to find out. So the first would be to get up, walk over to the elephant, and just sort of walk in a circle around it, eyeing it from every angle suspiciously. Because you know that if at some angle it just vanishes, then it was something more like a mirage and less like a mammal. And the other strategy you can use is to just turn to the Googler next to you and say, do you see that elephant too? And if she says no or just stares at you blankly, then you know that you should probably go see a neurologist. And why do you know that? Because you know that something is only real if it remains invariant in every reference frame. OK. so. Just because something's not ultimately real, it doesn't mean it has to be a hallucination, right? Like, take a rainbow. Is a rainbow real? Well, not really, right? I mean, it's not subjective. It's not a hallucination. Um, but it's also not like a physical object hanging in the sky. You can't go touch it because it's a product of your reference frame, right? You see a rainbow when you're standing in just the right spot and the sun's streaming in from behind you and the light's being refracted by the moisture in the air. And if you ask the guy next to you, do you see that rainbow too, he'll probably say yes. But if you run the test of walking around it in a circle, you will eventually see it disappear. Because it's not invariant. It's not ultimately real. It's not a fundamental ingredient of ultimate reality. And so if you want to find the fundamental ingredients of ultimate reality, the something that arose from nothing, you have to find what's invariant. So if there's one thing that you remember about physics, let it be that. It was Einstein who first recognized this link between invariance and reality. And I would actually argue that this was Einstein's single greatest contribution to physics, which I realize is a very bold statement. He did a lot of things. Special relativity, general relativity, it's not even what he won the Nobel Prize for. He won it for the photoelectric effect, which is just so badass if you think about it, because it's like the thing he won the Nobel Prize for barely cracks the list of the best things he ever did. But the best thing he ever did was to illuminate this link between invariance and reality, because it set the future trajectory of modern physics in motion, and it changed physics from being a set of rules and numbers that describe how levers and pulleys work to being a way to glimpse the reality behind appearances. And there's a good reason that no one before Einstein thought of this link between invariance and reality. And it's that before Einstein, everyone shared the same reference frame. So in a Newtonian universe, the speed of light is instantaneous, which means everyone sees the same thing. So everything's invariant. And in Einstein's universe, this is no longer true. So Einstein realized that in order for every observer to see the same laws of physics, um, Every observer has to measure the speed of light to be the same. And so it doesn't matter if you're running a million miles an hour or you're standing still as you measure a beam of light. That beam of light is going to be moving at 186,000 miles per second. And what's important about that number is that it's finite. Light does not travel instantaneously. It takes time. Right? Light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. Light from distant galaxies takes millions or even billions of years. And so looking out into the universe is a way of looking back in time. But the point is you can't see everything. The universe that you can see is bounded by the fact that light has only had 14 billion years to reach you. And so beyond that, the universe for you is dark. Now the boundary that marks the very edge 
of what you can see is called your horizon, and it's uniquely yours. You are sitting at the center of a sphere that encompasses your one-of-a-kind universe, and the person next to you is sitting at the center of a different sphere. Now, they mostly overlap, but not entirely. And so Einstein realized that in a universe with a finite speed of light, every observer occupies a unique reference frame. So you can no longer just describe the universe without first specifying from whose frame you're describing it. Because things might look very different from one frame to another. And if things look very different from one frame to another, this introduces a fundamentally new problem. How do you know which things are real? And Einstein figured out the solution. Something is real if it's invariant in every reference frame. So it was this way of thinking that led Einstein to his famous discovery, right? By analyzing how things look from different frames, he was able to see that space and time, which everyone had always assumed were the same for every observer, are in fact not the same for every observer. They look different from one reference frame to another. So what I see as space, you might experience as time and vice versa. And so space and time are not invariant. They are relative to your reference frame. That's what relativity is. But he found that there is something that remains invariant, and that is this combination of space and time, this unified four-dimensional space-time. So we might disagree on measurements of space or of time, but everyone will always agree on measurements of this combined space-time. OK, so space and time are not real. Space-time is real. And everyone always focuses on the first part, because it's like, really mind-blowing. Like, space and time aren't real. But Einstein actually cared more about the second part, because he knew that the key to finding ultimate reality is to find the invariant. And actually, later in life, he said that he regretted calling it the theory of relativity and wished that instead he had called it the theory of invariance. So once we knew all this, my father and I now had like a concrete plan. Like the question, what is ultimately real? You know, what is the something that arose from nothing? It was no longer this sort of vague philosophical question. It was a rigorous physics question. You know, what is invariant? And so we were out to breakfast at a pancake house, and we wrote a list of possible ingredients of ultimate reality on a napkin. So things like space time, dimensionality, particles, strings, et cetera. Um, this image, by the way, is a recreation. The original napkin was eventually lost or possibly sneezed in. But we made this list, and then I used my journalism career to investigate each one. And I want to tell you about two of the items on the napkin. So the first one is particles. Particles seem pretty fundamental, right? If you ask, what is all the stuff in the universe made of? Particles is the obvious answer, or that's what I thought. Um, until I encountered the work of Stephen Hawking. So I have to confess something. When I was first learning all of this stuff, I had this suspicion that Stephen Hawking was overrated. Like, I just wasn't convinced that his contribution to physics could be proportionate to his fame. Because there's just something about a guy that speaks in a computer voice that sort of automatically sounds like a genius. You know, like he automatically sounds like he knows something no one else could possibly know. But as I studied his work, I learned that he had done this remarkable calculation in the 1970s. Actually, he was annoyed at another physicist, and so he was doing this calculation in order to show that this other guy was wrong. And the calculation proved three things. First, that revenge is an excellent fuel for genius. Second, that I was an idiot, because if anything, Hawking is underrated. His physics is brilliant, and the only thing that's disproportionate is the fact that everyone knows who Stephen Hawking is, but if you ask them what did he actually do that was so important, hardly anyone knows. But now you guys will know, because I'll tell you the third thing. His calculation proved that particles are not ultimately real. And here's why. So thanks to quantum mechanics, Empty space is not really empty. The uncertainty principle tells us there's a trade-off between time and energy, which means that on incredibly short time scales, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, large amounts of energy can bubble up out of empty space. And this energy takes the form of pairs of particles and antiparticles that emerge 
from empty space and then meet and annihilate and in the blink of an eye disappear. And this is happening all the time, all around us. These particles and antiparticles emerging, meeting, annihilating, and disappearing. But it happens so quickly that we just refer to them as virtual particles. But when Hawking was doing this calculation, he realized that something different happens when you have a horizon. And so, as you already know, a horizon marks the, an edge beyond which light can't reach an observer, right? So we talked about the horizon that surrounds your unique universe. And there's an analogous kind of horizon. It's actually a mathematically equivalent kind of horizon that surrounds a black hole. So in this case, the horizon marks the edge beyond which light can't escape gravity's clutches in order to reach an observer on the outside. So if you're standing outside the black hole, the horizon marks the edge of what you can see. So Hawking realized that if these pairs of particle, virtual particles and antiparticles are bubbling up out of empty space in the vicinity of a horizon, something sort of amazing can happen. The horizon can separate the pairs so that where one particle sort of is just outside the horizon, its antiparticle partner can be just inside the black hole, and now they can no longer annihilate. And so instead of disappearing, they just stick around. These virtual particles are not so virtual anymore. They're actually totally normal particles. They're exactly the same as the particles that make up anything in this room. You could collect a bunch of them and build a chair. But there would be something really weird about that chair, because it would owe its existence to the horizon, but the horizon's not a real thing. The horizon's not like a brick wall that's floating in space. The horizon's like a rainbow. It's a product of a reference frame, namely the reference frame of an observer who is lucky enough to remain outside the black hole. And textbooks tend to call the observer outside the black hole Bob. I like to call him safe. <laughs> There's another kind of observer who's not so lucky, um, an observer who's in inertial motion, free fall, can't escape gravity's clutches, and falls straight through the horizon and into the black hole. And I like to call him screwed. So from Safe's point of view, these once virtual particles that can no longer annihilate with their partners are streaming out from the horizon as if the black hole is radiating. That's why we call it Hawking radiation. But for Scrooge, there is no horizon. He just falls straight through, and there's no edge of what he can see. So for Scrooge, these virtual particles just continue to annihilate and disappear like always. And so where Safe sees this stream of hot particles, Scrooge just sees ordinary empty space. So you see what's happening here. The particles are not invariant. And that's what Hawking discovered that's so important. Particles are not ultimately real. They're a product of your reference frame, not only in the vicinity of a black hole, but everywhere, because every one of us is surrounded by a horizon. So my father and I crossed particles off the list on the napkin. Now, Hawking's discovery has driven and continues to drive theoretical physics forward for the last four decades because it's rife with paradoxes. And there is nothing that a physicist loves more than a paradox. And I'll give you an example. So let's take our elephant from the lobby and throw him into a black hole. All right, there he goes. So SAFE is watching this from afar. And so we can ask. In SAFE's reference frame, what does this look like? And fair warning, it's not pretty. So from SAFE's point of view, the elephant is going to fall towards the black hole and then encounter this stream of hot Hawking radiation. And he's going to be burned to a crisp before he ever crosses the horizon. And his ashes will just sort of emanate back into the universe. OK, so that's gruesome and terrible. but. We can also look at Scrooge's point of view, right? Because Scrooge is just falling straight through alongside the elephant. And for Scrooge, there is no horizon. So there are no hot particles to harm any animals. And so for Scrooge, the elephant is just in ordinary empty space. And he can live out the rest of his life until he eventually reaches the center of the black hole. 
So there's a problem, okay? The laws of physics require that both of these stories be true. If either one of them were not true, you'd violate a law of physics. And so the elephant has to be both dead in a pile of ashes outside the black hole and alive and well inside the black hole. That alone is just weird, but the problem comes in because there's another law of physics that's equally as fundamental as the others that says you can't have two copies of the same elephant. So both stories have to be true and both stories can't be true. That's the paradox. And it was a physicist named Lenny Susskind who solved this paradox. He said, as long as you stick to one observer's reference frame, as long as you talk about what safe sees or what screwed sees, all the laws of physics remain intact. It's only when you try to talk about their points of view simultaneously that you see these two illegal copies of the elephant. So it's this picture that's the problem. Einstein had said, you know, if you describe the universe, you have to first specify your reference frame. And the fact is, this is an unphysical reference frame. It's impossible. There's no one who can see inside and outside a horizon simultaneously. That's the idea of a horizon. And so as long as we just stick to physical reference frames, what an observer could actually see, there, we never see two copies of the elephant, and all the laws of physics remain intact. So the problem is solved. But there's still something very unsettling about that, because we would like to think that there's some actual answer to the question, where is the elephant, right? Is the elephant dead outside the black hole, or is it alive inside the black hole? We like to think that there's some real answer. And what this is telling us is that there's not. So Susskind realized that the location of the elephant in space-time is not invariant. So space-time, this unified four-dimensional space-time that was left invariant by Einstein's theory of invariance, turns out not to be invariant after all. And so my dad and I had to cross space-time off the list. So we continued our search for these ever-elusive invariants, these fundamental ingredients of ultimate reality. I was running around the world having you know, fascinating conversations with these brilliant physicists and usually making a total fool of myself in the process. And often my dad was there with me, and when he couldn't be, I would report back to him and detail all of my crazy adventures and everything I had learned. But looking back on this 17-year journey, here's what I realize now. If I if it weren't for my father, I would have never done any of this. Like even if I had somehow become interested in physics on my own, I would have never crashed a conference posing as a journalist. I would have never turned one little lie into an entire career. Because without my dad there at my side or on the other end of the phone, it wouldn't have been fun. And it wouldn't have meant anything. And that's the thing about invariance. It doesn't just make objects real. It makes our lives real. And I really think that's why we need other people. We need them because they bear witness to our lives. And in doing so, they anchor us to the world. They anchor us to a reality that can be seen from every angle when you walk around it. I needed my dad because that second reference frame gave my life a sense of invariance and created between us a shared reality so that every time I learned something deep and wondrous about the universe, I could turn to my dad and say, do you see that too? And he could smile back at me and say, yes. But just as we were creating this shared reality, we were also chipping away at it piece by piece as we crossed item after item off the napkin, slowly undermining the very notion of a shared reality. Because once you know this one thing about physics, that what's real is what's invariant, the entire trajectory of physics sort of snaps into focus. The whole history of physics, from Einstein to exactly what's going on right now, has been a steady and relentless progression of invariant after invariant giving way to observer dependence and illusion. And so the list of fundamental ingredients of reality is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so we can ask, like, where does this trajectory end? Does it end with one fundamental ingredient, one invariant, 
one thing that everything else is made of? Well, that used to be the hope. I mean, a lot of people thought that. That was sort of the idea of, of string theory, right? That all these different things, all this variety we see in the world is actually all just made up of this one ingredient, these little vibrating strings. But the most exciting and interesting and challenging thing that's happened in string theory in recent years is that it's turned out that strings are not invariant. And so physicists are starting to think that maybe there's not one fundamental ingredient. And so, so where does the trajectory end? Does it end at nothing? Because here's the interesting thing about nothing. If you think about it not in terms of what it isn't, but in terms of what it is, an infinite unbounded homogeneous state is by definition invariant in every possible reference frame. So my dad had started with this sort of existential question of you know, how do you get something from nothing? And now everything we were learning was presenting us with the very real possibility that that something might not be made of anything, that the something might be nothing. And on the one hand, that's really good news because that actually offers a possible solution to this sort of ancient existential riddle. But on the other hand, it's kind of a bummer when you've just spent 17 years trying to create a shared reality with your father, only to learn that there may be no such thing. You know, physics taught me that I have my reference frame and my dad has his reference frame, and they mostly overlap, but not entirely, which I think is just another way to say that over the past 17 years, physics has taught me what it means to grow up. But still, I'm comforted to know that there is a reference frame in which we are together, side by side, my dad and me. And that's the reference frame that sits between the covers of my book. So thank you very much. I can take questions if anyone has. Uh, what's a good suggestion for getting our daughters involved in math and science? Um, you have a chance to speak with a lot of people who've made this be their profession. And uh, from their experience and yours, what do you think is a good first step? So I think it depends on like personality a lot. So for me, I was sort of this rebellious kid. And I think if physics had been presented to me in any normal way, like as like something you have to study in school, I just don't think it would have ever like captured my imagination. I think it was the fact that my dad presented it as this like secret thing that we were gonna do, and it was this mission, and we're gonna figure out the origin of the universe, and it felt like by doing physics, I was rebelling in some way. And so, which actually, I mean, I've thought about this a lot. I think physics is a very, inherently rebellious subject because it requires you to sort of question everything we think we know about reality. And if you look at sort of the greatest physicists of all time, they tend to be very rebellious characters. So I think it's sort of a shame because a lot of times the people who are sort of encouraged to go into science and math tend to be like the sort of very studious people who sort of like go by the book. And that's not always going to be, I mean, you need that, but that's not always going to be like the most creative thinkers. And I think sometimes we weed out creative thinkers who could have really contributed to physics by not appealing to that type of kid. Um, but you know, I realize not everyone's going to go on a secret mission for 17 years to figure out the nature of the universe. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I really think it's like the physics that's taught in school, like you don't get to the really good stuff until you've already sort of committed, right? So like you do Newtonian physics in high school. And then it's not until like if you did physics in college, like you'll start to get into relativity and quantum mechanics. And that's where it gets really cool. But I think you can actually present those topics to kids without needing a crazy amount of math that they don't have. And so I think if there was a way to present the cooler parts of physics, the really exciting, sort of mind-blowing stuff earlier on, so that they would see that, OK, I have to get through all this other stuff, but it's going to be really good. I feel like you know people would be more into it that way. Hi. 
Um, so I'm actually like about 50% through your book right now. Um, and I have this problem when reading like these sort of theoretical physics books, which is that, you know, I usually follow through, you know, special relativity and general relativity. But once I get to sections about, you know, um, like supersymmetry and string theory and things like that, you know, I, I just stop understanding. And um, you actually talk a little bit about this in your book that, you know, part of the problem here is that these descriptions aren't actually like accurate because really they're just describing these mathematical equations. Right. Um, so is it impossible to understand this stuff without understanding like the math involved or is this is this something that like you encountered when you were learning this at some point? Did you just like say like wow like you know I didn't take physics but now I have to like learn you know differential equations just to you know even understand this at all? Right, it's a really good question, um, and I've sort of struggled with this because there definitely were times where I was like oh my god like I'm reading through these papers and I'm like if I knew this math this would be a lot easier and I think it's true what you were referring to, like this idea that physics is expressed in mathematics, right? And then if you try to translate that into English, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between English and math. And so something is inevitably lost in the translation. Um, and, and science writers tend to rely a lot on metaphors. And so now you're almost like at another level where you're like losing a little bit of something out. It might make it easier to sort of understand, but on the other hand, you're like losing more of the nuance. And so you might say you can't really understand it unless you understand the math. But on the other hand, you know, like the joke that like the meaning of life, the universe, and everything is 42. Like the reason that's funny, like why is 42 not a satisfying answer? Because you want like an answer in English, right? Like you want, like a number wouldn't be the answer because we want to know what it means. And so the math doesn't tell you what anything means. And so even though you lose something in the translation, you gain a sense of meaning. And a lot of physics is really based on principles and having these foundational principles and then deriving the math from that. You know, that's how Einstein worked. And so you can understand all the principles without understanding like the particular solutions of equations. And so I think you actually can have a complete big picture understanding, even if you can't sit down and, you know, actually do a particular problem. So my understanding of string theory, uh, by the way, I really enjoy your, your talk. Oh, thank you. Um, my understanding of string theory is a little bit uh, outdated. Um, why are strings uh, not invariant? Yeah, great question. Um, so there was a period of time where everyone was hoping that that was the case. And then physicists realized they had five different versions of string theory that were all completely consistent. And so this was sort of an embarrassment of riches, like you don't want five theories of everything, you want one theory of everything. And so this was sort of a crisis and Ed Witten came along and he realized that actually these five string theories, even though they look very different, are all mathematically equivalent. There's transformations that you can make to go from one to another. And that's really unexpected because you have like a theory with strings vibrating in 10 dimensions. And then you have a theory of like these membranes in 11 dimensions. And then you have particles. And you have like radically different space-time geometries and, and things that you, what would look to us like drastically different physical worlds. And they're actually all descriptions of the same thing. And so that was. You know, people refer to that as the second superstring revolution, and that was sort of considered this amazing step because, like, oh, we don't really have five theories; we have one theory, and now we'll call it M theory, and that's great. But what M theory is telling you is that things like dimensionality and strings are not invariant because what look like strings in one 
point of view, one of these theories, look like particles in another. And they look at the membranes in another. And what looks like 10 dimensions in one is 11 dimensions in another. And there's no way to say that, like, it's not like one's right and one's wrong. It's just that there are two different ways of looking at the exact same thing. And so now M theory basically undermined the idea that you can have an invariant fundamental ingredient. Yeah. I was, was snooping at your bookshelf. So I, I know you've run into uh, a couple of these. And I'm, I'm not going to remember the guys' names. But there are a couple of people who um, look at the, the, the sort of Evolving contradictions uh, and and you know if you wind up proving that nothing is is real you know like if all of our particles that make up us in this room right now originated uh, as, as Hawking radiation and and you know so there's some frame of reference from which absolutely nothing is real that. Uh, that you you sort of need to find another kind of answer to things that what you've you've that I, I think of that uh, is sort of like um, uh, Gödel's you know notion of of completeness and being able to prove the system is, is complete and that, that maybe so you've got the guy who thinks that uh, the entire universe is a cellular automata mm -hmm. and then there's also the uh, the, the sort of thought experiment thing that suggests that maybe the entire universe is a simulation and somebody else's universe. Uh, and I, I don't know. I just wondered what you, what you thought about those kind of notions. Yeah. The, so they're all really interesting. Um, I think the same problems sort of plague all of those ideas. And the, the simulation question is really interesting. And it's actually directly related to Gödel's incompleteness theorem, because the sort of main conceptual difficulty in talking about the universe as a whole, especially when you have to apply like quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole, is the fact that unlike anything else that we know of, the universe only has an inside. It doesn't have an outside. It's like a one-sided coin. And so you can't have an observer outside the universe. So the universe is this like set that contains itself. You know, like you get into these weird paradoxes. And the, the, there's no way for an observer to describe the universe without it being self-referential in some sense, because the observer is part of the universe. And so with the simulation question, you're saying, you know, what if this whole universe is actually, you know, a simulation embedded on a computer in some higher reality? Well, for one thing, I don't know that it would matter that much. Like, there would still be some fundamental laws of physics that I really believe you would be able to figure out. Um, but there's also. Like, in order to assess the reality of reality, you have to step outside of it, right? So like to know that you were a simulation, you'd have to be outside the simulation. And then how do you know that that's not a simulation? You'd have to be outside of that. And so it's, again, this question of what is your reference frame? Like, because by definition, you can't be outside reality. And so there is no reference frame from which you can determine the reality of reality. And so. I don't know if that totally answers your question, but I think I think all of these issues that you're raising are very related. Um, and you know, Stephen Wolfram's theory that you were referring to um, is really interesting. I don't really know it well enough to comment that intelligibly, but I mean, it's it's going to be subject to the same issues that we're talking about here because. You know, it's another way of doing things, but it still has to like replicate all of physics as we know it. And so it's going to run into these same questions. Anyone else? One more question. Sure. That makes sense, because this stuff's amazing, but also makes my head spin. But what is, you said there is a trajectory, and things are, you know, what is invariance becoming smaller and smaller, and it may be nothing. But what is the end game for, obviously, there's an end game for people that study this and 
are amazed by it and everything else. But for someone who doesn't have this understanding, or and, and when if there is an end game where it does become figured out, does it have an effect on those? Like, what what effect could it have on people outside of just in theory? Probably none. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I don't think it's gonna like have technological applications or something. I mean, I don't, you never know, right? You never know, you can never see these things coming. But I think this is really just about answering sort of deep existential questions that humans have been asking for as long as there have been humans, right? I mean, the question of like, what is real? What am I? How am I here? What am I seeing? I mean, it's just, I think it's just things that we deeply want to know. And, and it's funny because on the one hand, it seems like incredibly abstract, especially if you're talking about you know, 14 billion years ago and the origin of the universe or the cosmos, which is so huge, and quantum mechanics, which the scale is so tiny, and you sort of can't like, place yourself in these things. But I always have these moments where, because like, I get you know, I start thinking about this stuff and I kind of start taking it for granted a little bit. And then like all of a sudden I'll have this moment where I'm like, oh my God, like I'm talking about like literally like this isn't real. You know, like I'll have like, I'm talking about the stuff right here and me and all of us. And so it's not that abstract. It's just like you can't really live your life thinking about it every minute like that or else you're going to have a problem. But yeah, so I think it's just sort of, I mean, I think any time you have a better understanding of the way that nature works, it's going to have some positive effect. Or maybe not positive, but it's going to have some effect. It's going to be useful in some way. Um, but yeah, when you get to this level, like, will it be practical? Probably not. Sorry for being a stick in the mud, but uh, <laughs> if, there, if strings aren't invariant, is, are there any invariants in M-theory? There are not that anyone knows of. Um, and it's really interesting, because when I've talked to string theorists, and I'll say, like, like you, you'll hear a lot, string theorists will say things like, we don't really know what the theory is. Like, we have all these equations. We have the theory, but we don't know what it's a theory of. And what they mean by that is, like, you know, like, Quantum field theory is a theory of quantum fields. String theory was a theory of strings. M theory, they don't know. Like, they have this theory and they don't know what it's describing. And there's no basic ontology there. And, and they're well aware of that. And it's like, they see it as either something will emerge and there will be something that is describing that we just don't realize yet. I happen to think it's actually more useful if, if there's not an ontology there, because now you can answer this question of how you get something from nothing. But I mean, it's really fascinating. Like M theory, like, you know, if you read physics books, like everything you read will say, nobody knows what the M stands for. Like, maybe it stands for mystery or mother or magic or, um, you know, I think there was a Nobel Prize winner who said, I think it stands, it's the upside down W for Witten. And, um, people had all these theories about like, like even you read Stephen Hawking's book, it's like, no one knows what the M stands for. And I'm kind of like, how can no one know? Like Ed Witten coined it and he's still alive. Like why doesn't someone just ask him? And so I went and I asked him and he was like, it stands for membrane. Like I, you know, originally said like, oh, it could be mother or mystery or whatever, but I was kidding, you know, and nobody really got the joke. But so the M stands for membrane, but membranes are not invariant in that theory. And so, so there's a deeper point to the like no one knows what M stands for, which is even though like literally it stands for membrane, I think part of what that means is like they don't know what it's a theory of, which has never really happened. I mean, it's like a weird way of doing physics, but fascinating. All right, thank you guys so much for coming.